Okay, let's start off our discussion with the uterus in terms of talking about its three main functions. So, in no particular order, this is going to be the source of menstruation flow. We'll talk about which particular layers of the uterus will provide this. It is also the site of implantation of a blastocyst. And lastly, this is going to be where the fetus will develop during pregnancy. So fetus development. So as you can see, it's very dependent on uh, what is going on per month. If there is implantation and fertilization, then there'll be very different functions as opposed to uh, just typical menstruation, monthly menstruation. So we'll talk about uh, those in a bit more detail as we move on. But first, let's talk about the different parts of the uterus. We're going to start with the most superior portion, which is the fundus. And what you can see about the fundus is it's this area that's superior to the uterine tubes, or where the uterine tubes attach to the uterus, where you have the entering there. And that's really important in terms of uh, understanding in which direction or which tilt the uterus has. So we'll talk about the fundus in a bit more detail there. The majority of the uterus is referred to as the body. So all of this right here is considered the uterine body. The isthmus, similar to what we had with the uterine tube, is kind of this pinched in area of the narrowing portion of the uterus that leads into the cervix. And the cervix is going to be the most inferior portion of the uterus. This is one of the more immovable. There is some movement, but for the most part, it's immovable. It's very fibrous in comparison to the rest of the uterus, which is uh, mostly muscular, but we have a lot more fibrosity associated with the cervix. That's why you can palpate the cervix um, in some type of digital exam, but you're not necessarily able to do so with the more muscular portions of the, the rest of the uterus. Now let's talk about the, uh, the hollow portions of the uterus. The majority of the lumen is referred to as the uterine cavity. So this portion right in here that will lead into the cervical canal. Now we're going to talk about the internal and external uh, os in just a minute, but before we move on to that, I want to talk about the organization of the uterus in relation to the bladder and the rectum. So if we're looking here, this is going to be more anterior. This is going to be more posterior. You can see the uterus is kind of right here in the middle. The bladder is going to be located here, and the rectum is going to be located here. So it's right kind of in, the, in between the bladder and the rectum. Dependent on how full the bladder is, that can change the position of the uterus. And one thing I want you to note here, and we'll bring this picture back up again in a second, that you have um, the majority of the body, and in particular the fundus of the uterus, that's going to be tilted more anteriorly. Now let's look at another image to talk about the internal and the external os. So internal os here, this is the uterine cavity entering into the cervical canal. So it's kind of that, that space or that entryway into that. Whereas the external os is that cervical canal entering into the vagina. And so you have these two different areas. You talk about them differently, or clinicians will discuss those separately. So we make sure we understand those terms. Okay, so we kind of introduce the term flexion when you're describing the direction of the uterus. And so you'll have two real ways that you discuss this, or flexion as well as version. So let's start with flexion first. And what we are really focused on when you're talking about flexion is the angle between the body of the uterus, so the uterus here, and the cervix. So in which way it is angled. Antiflexion, you have it more anteriorly placed, so the body of the uterus is going to be kind of tilted that way. Whereas retroflexion, you'll have the body of the uterus more posteriorly tilted. Antiflexion is the more typical presentation in terms of the uterus. Then you'll hear the terms antiversion and retroversion. These are different than the flexions that we just discussed here. And what we're focused on here is the angle between the cervix and the vagina. And the vagina is going to be 
this right here. Antiversion, you're going to have um, the cervix more anteriorly placed, and this is the more typical presentation. In retroversion, you'll have a more posterior tilt. So antiflexed, antiverted uterus is the most typical presentation. Now, if there's a retroflexion or a retroversion, it's not uh, necessarily symptomatic or troublesome. Um, sometimes you can have a prolapse associated with retroversion, um, but not necessarily so. Now, ligaments associated with the uterus. We've been talking about this broad ligament. We'll kind of finish it up now. So let's review really quickly those three parts of the broad ligament. You have your meso, salpinx, and think about it. Try to remember where is, what is this associated with? It's going to be associated with the uterine tube. You'll have your mesovarium which is going to be associated with the ovaries. And then you'll have your mesometrium. And that's kind of the, the bulk of the broad ligament. So all of this yellowish shading right here around the uterus, that's going to be the mesometrium. So it plays a very big role in terms of anchoring and keeping that uh, uterus associated with the lateral wall. Also important to note, Broad ligament is peritoneal in origin. Now also of uh, great importance is the cardinal ligaments. And this serves as the main passive source of protection of the uterus and the vagina and its attachment to the pelvic wall. This is a very fibrous uh, part of the ligament. So a lot of times if you have sutures related uh, to this region, associated with surgeries, a lot of times you can go through the cardinal ligaments because those are tough enough as opposed to peritoneal linings like the broad ligament. And then lastly we have the round ligament and you can see the round ligament right here. The round ligament is like uh, the ovarian ligament we discussed previously. This is a remnant of that gubernaculum. The round ligament is an attachment of the uterus all the way to the labium majora. So important in terms of keeping it tethered in that region. So you have enough flexibility to have the uterus move some, uh, particularly, or particularly with the, the filling of the bladder, but enough to keep it in its place, particularly during pregnancy. All right, so let's talk about the layers of the uterus, and we'll start with the outermost layer, which is your parametrium. Uh, so you often hear this referred to as serosa. And really what's important here is this is part of the peritoneum, and you're gonna have an association of the peritoneum with the other organs in this region for the physico-uterine pouch and the recto-uterine pouch. And let's look at a picture of this. I think it'll give you a better idea of what we're talking about. All right, so all this kind of shiny stuff that you see in this picture is covering the organs in this region. So let's start with finding the uterus. The uterus is going to be located right there. And then your urinary bladder is right here. So that peritoneum is just gonna kind of lie on top of those two structures. And then the bladder and the uterus are gonna be located underneath that region. So that space, that little pouch formed in the middle is referred to as the fascico-uterine pouch. So fascico, you know, we're talking about the bladder. Then you're gonna have the rectum back in this region. So the recto-uterine pouch, which is similar in terms of being just a peritoneal um, pouch in this region is gonna be quite a bit deeper, as you can see from this image, than the fascico-uterine pouch. And this is closely related to the fornices of the vagina, and we'll talk about those in more specifics uh, when we talk about the vagina, but this is gonna be the more clinically relevant uh, pouch, so the recto-uterine. As we move deeper, we're getting to the myometrium, uh, anytime you have the term myo, you know we're talking muscle. And so you have three layers of smooth muscle. These will contract um, during labor in order to help expel the, the fetus. It can also contract uh, during um, the menstrual cycle, and you get what's referred to as cramps. So this is going to be the, 
The middle layer, it can change dramatically depending on what's going on with the uterus. So during pregnancy and when there's a fetus, you will have um, a great extension but thinning of the muscle in this region. Then lastly, the deepest layer is the endometrium, which is particularly important in terms of the menstrual cycle. This is highly, highly vascularized, and so that makes sense when you're thinking about menstrual flow. And there's two main parts of the endometrium. There's the stratum functionalis. This is the part that will be sloughed off during menstruation. And then the stratum basalis, which is always the permanent layer and will help the formation of the stratum functionalis after uh, the menstrual flow. Endometriosis is uh, a disorder where you're going to have endometrial tissue formed outside of the uterus. Okay, so you can have it in the peritoneal cavity, you can have it associated with other organs in the pelvic cavity. And what happens with this endometrial tissue is that it will be affected by the hormones no matter where it's at. So if um, you have the release of hormones around the, the menstrual cycle time, then you're going to have the, the vascularization, um, the engorgement of that blood in that region, and you can have bleeding in areas where you wouldn't typically have it during the typical menstrual cycle. Now, the arterial supply of the uterus is the uterine arteries, and these are going to be branches of the internal iliac arteries. Remember, if we kind of trace our way back in terms of the internal iliac, internal iliac is a branch of the common iliac, and the common iliacs uh, are going to be at that bifurcation of the aorta. So there's your abdominal aorta, common iliacs, and then those common iliacs will divide into the external iliacs and the internal iliacs. So pretty much everything that we're talking about with pelvic organs are going to be supplied by branches of the internal iliacs other than the ovaries, which we know are going to be direct branches from the abdominal aorta. One last thing I want to note is um, talking a little bit more about the cervix, and we'll bring this back in a further discussion, but that cervix is going to be the most immobile portion of the uterus. It's going to be the most fibrous or hardest portion of the uterus, so you can um, palpate the, the cervix through a digital exam. What's also unique about this, the cervix is you're going to have the secretion of cervical mucus, and this changes dependent on uh, at what point in the, the um, the menstrual cycle you're in. So if you're menstruating or you're ovulating, this will be a, a little bit uh, less, uh, it'll be a little more fluid than you would have in other types of the cycle. So you have these secretory cells within the cervix for the specific, um, for the specific secretion of this mucus. So we've kind of understood the overall organization of the uterus. We've talked a little bit about the layers of that. We're going to continue inferiorly to the vagina in order to lead to the discussion of the external genitalia.